On this episode of the PP, we are featuring a very special guest. He is known in my mind as one of the best medical sales guys in the entire world. He has sold internationally in over 42 countries across five continents. So you could say this guy's got some experience. He gives away the secret sauce of his sales process literally in the beginning of the episode. I give away the secret sauce of the first chapter. I'm going to give it away here too on this podcast. So it's like, you don't have to buy my book to get it. Okay? So like no gatekeeping here. You're welcome. And if you want to check out the book he just wrote called Authentic Sales, the link is in the description. And we're also giving you guys a 10% discount on the book. So that won't be here forever. Make sure you use that discount while you can. And without further ado, enjoy the episode. Welcome to the PP. I'm your host, Joseph, with co-host Jordan and special guest today, Travis McCoy. He wrote this amazing book, Authentic Sales, and uh, honestly, Travis, it is great to have you here. Thank you guys for having me. I've been waiting a while to get on y'all's show, so I appreciate it. Give you a little bit more about him. I figured you could just kind of tell the viewers a little bit more about yourself. Yeah. So I am a sales guy through and throughout, been selling as long as I can remember, and spent the last 25 years medical sales, the last 20 years with one company, and then in that company, the last nine years, international. So coaching and working on business development in all the countries outside the United States. Like what, what kind of countries? I spent a lot of time in Japan, Australia, the Nordics, um, Russia, Middle East, Korea, India, Mexico, Colombia, Canada. So yeah. And before we, before we kind of keep going, guys, we read the book and it's honestly, it's amazing. I, I'm going back and just rereading through my notes on the book and this stuff just, it's like. It's cyclical, like it just keeps coming back again and again and again. So just if you want the book, watch this podcast and you'll know pretty quick whether or not you want to get this book and read it. Yeah, I wanted to compliment you actually on the book because I'm so ADD and like you got my attention. Like you think it's a book on sales, but like you got my attention. I'm like, this guy's good. <laughs> he nailed it. And in speaking of attention, to get the your attention, I want to start off with it, but everybody wants to know. How much money is on the table? How much money you made? How did like? Oh, how much money can you make in medical sales? Like, if these guys want to do sales, if they want to get into it, how much money can they make? I mean, he drives a Tesla Plaid, so I mean, the house has paid off. I didn't drive. You know, what's funny is um, I want to share because I do think that's important to share with people. But the same token, I used to hate watching videos or whatever people brag about how much money they make. They kind of in device sales, they want you if you're. If you're hitting your quota and just making, they want you about two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And if you are exceptionally well, it's very common for most medical sales guys to make about five hundred a year. Yeah. Um, and then if you're the top, you're 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 pushing up on the million when you're the when you're top. And these are W two guys. I'm not talking about ten ninety nine where you're a distributor or something like that. These are the the W two guys. Back in the day, it used to be pacemaker reps. They're the ones. So it's like it's so it's five hundred thousand like the the low end. No, 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 no. What is the low end? No, low end would be like 135, 150. So if you're not good at sales, just because you get a medical sales job doesn't mean you're going to crush it. No, well, you're, you're- 135 still kind of feels like crushing it. <laughs> I feel like that, it also depends on what you're actually selling though too, like what device or what you get paired up with. Yeah, so if you think about selling as solution-based selling and solution-based selling is, 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 is the core and heart of selling anything and everything. As you move into medical sales- you can kind of be an order taker, right? You got a good surgeon in the area that you live in and you service them real well and they know what they're doing. They're a key opinion leader. They're published. They're doing, and you're there just kind of servicing them and they like you because they trust you. You're dependable. You'll still make great money. The ones that can do the solution-based selling where they're, they're going into a market where maybe there's not a good referral relationship between some cardiologists and family practitioners. And maybe just the hospitalist, and there's just, and they that rep gets in there and starts to connect and get these doctors taking them to dinner to introduce them to each other and talk about how they can improve the community together by the the flow of patients back and forth. That type of rep, boom, they're gonna right away be making five hundred, six hundred solution based selling, man. If you just focus on that in any industry that you're in, you're going to the next level. So I, obviously, I wanted to start with money because that's that's what a lot of people want to know is like how much could I make? I watch things all the time, and I'm like, you know, yeah. Should I pivot to do that? Because it looks like it can make a lot of money. 
medical sales has its quotas, has its pressure, it has its middle management issues. So, so you're not sales if you're in industrial sales. A lot of things that you don't like, there's going to be in medical sales too. Yeah. Well, and that, the other point of it, like you said, 135 being the low end, I was like, oh, that's making it big. I mean, it's it's not, but it is a lot of money. So it's like, yeah. even though I'm shooting for the moon, landed among the stars, like I'm still doing really well. But it kind of brings me to my next thing is like the secret sauce. So I immediately like want to get these guys like, when they click on this video, like, thank you for clicking, by the way, and watching. But when they click on this, they want to know money. But they also want to know, like, what do you do for sales? Like, whether mm -hmm. they're selling cars, whether they're selling medical devices, whatever it is. Like, what is the secret All right. sauce? So let me finish off on your last point of the money. So let's make the money real clear. So you get in, you might start with a base salary, like 65 with some bonuses and whatever. And you kind of low end about 135. The company wants you to be about 200, 250, most companies. So they will pour into you and invest, invest time and resources in you to develop you to get you next level. Management wants you there, quotas and stuff like that. They, they want you there. The ones that break out because there's really solution-based mindset, they're just good at what they do, they just know how to network or whatever. Those are the guys that push well beyond 500. And then every company will have two or three guys on the, the team that are making above 700. Very rare do you break a million, but it is. We have a, a couple guys at the company I just left that were right there at a million dollars. Great guys. Trust me, what they do, they deserve it. The lives they change and the patients that they touch, they deserve it. The doctors they network, the ones they bring in, they deserve it. So it's not just getting lucky and getting in. Those guys deserve it. If those guys sold paint for another company. If they sold heavy equipment, they would make a million dollars too because they're good. Those guys are good. Are these regular, they're good too. Are these regular people? Like they just... Oh, some of them come up as, as a clinical specialist assistant They move on up. So it's not like we're out there recruiting these top performers. No, we, a lot of people were internally coming up. Organizations deal with it differently. There was such a product now. So I was selling a spinal cord stimulator implant and a deep brain stimulator implant was the two primary products. The product knowledge was so hard and so difficult and so deep that really you would promote underneath. So you would clinical specialists getting used to the patient, used to programming them, promote up. It's not always the case. Let's move to your uh, secret sauce. Yeah, I, lo I love calling it the secret sauce because it's just like, what is that thing you're doing? What is that thing that just makes this so good? Right. Why does this work so well? Okay. There's another thing that I used to hate. You buy a book, you read the first couple of chapters, and you get nothing out of it. It's like they're selling you on the book, but you already bought the book. So, so why do you keep trying to sell me on the book? Tell me it's going to come. It's going to come. So in my book, I made sure that I gave away the secret sauce in the first chapter. Okay. So I'm saying it again for anybody listening. I give away the secret sauce of the first chapter. I'm going to give it away here too on this podcast. So it's like, you don't even have to buy my book to get it. Okay. Hopefully you do buy the book, but I'm just going to give it away. My well, book. you're welcome. The secret sauce is finding the most interesting and meaningful reasons to return. When I was winning awards and coming off stage, there'd be a lot of young reps that were hungry looking to knock, knock me off my podium, but they were, you know, good hard. They come up like, how you do it? How you do it? And it was like every year I'd give a different answer. I didn't really know. Not to say I, I know my product better than everybody else. I'd say I work harder than everybody else. I say knock on one more door. You know, I never would drive by an account if it was not 6 p.m. I would go. There was a lot of clinics that I would go, hospitals and clinics where I'd go and knock and the department would be closed because I always wanted them, maybe someone was staying there late doing dictation, catching up on notes, and there's no pressure. I'm going to get some good time with the doctor. So I believe that was my why I was so successful. That's why I believe I was the number one rep for um, the seven out of the 11 years that I sold for them. When I went international, I started to observe the other best reps in those countries. And I started to see common denominators amongst different countries. Keep in mind, I was told each country is completely different. How you sell in Japan, you cannot sell in Colombia. How you sell in Colombia, you cannot sell in Germany. So I went in with that mindset. I was like observing, trying to figure out each country as its own situation or its own territory or its own, I don't want to call it, its own definition of sales in that country. I started to quickly see common denominators among the best reps, no matter what country I was in. Sort of jot them down, look at them, and now you're staring at it all collected together in, in this book. So this book isn't me telling you how I did it. This book is me sharing my observations of how the best reps across the world do it. I will use stories of myself validating and verifying that, hey, did this? Did I do this? What I just witnessed here in Tokyo, did I do this? What I just w witnessed here in Hamburg, Germany, did did, did, did I do yeah you know what I did that too so that is what this book is is a collection of that so here we go for the secret sauce again we'll repeat it it is finding the most interesting and meaningful reasons to return okay 
Because you can meet somebody, you can sell them, and then and then and then as a prospect, they go cold, and it gets harder and harder to get back in. And you can put whatever you want to put in your CMR and put whatever long sentence of what you sent them and this and that for your manager to read it. But the truth of the matter is, you don't have a re a meaningful and interesting reason to get back in front of them. So, whenever I started reading the book, you immediately said that you're not teaching just like a one-stop shop sales method. This was a sales method that would work for almost any industry. So I was like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll hear him out. Start reading the book. And you're, you're right. You said a reason to return. And even though I'm not in medical sales, this podcast almost operated the exact same way. So a re reason to return for the viewers and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm trying to give them reasons to come back and continue to watch each of these episodes with guests like yourself that can provide them with valuable information because like there's i'm sure there's business people that will watch this local businesses so they're targeting a specific market there's people who will watch this that are like maybe a representative of coke or something like that and they're targeting a global market and their process is still the same like how do we get people to come back to us a reason to return like you're saying absolutely and people know it. it's hard once you hear the dreaded words, don't call us, we'll call you, you're done. You're done. Game's over. It's all about luck now. Someone else has to screw up for you to get back in. I'm in, I'm in real estate, and this book definitely helps me with uh, just talking to people because you, you say in the book, people buy from who they like. You're not selling real estate. You're not sell, selling medical sales. You're selling yourself. Yep. They become, you become friends with them, and they like you, so they'll keep doing business with you. Sometimes I'll, I'll even talk to people about uh, real estate and then jump off totally like not even talking about anything to do with real estate we're talking about fishing we're talking about the weather now we're friends you know it's like if you want me to sell you a bottle of water i don't need to i'll just be friends with i'll sell you a case later you know yeah no you're exactly right and i think there's an order to that and i talk about that in the book too because what you said i think is extremely important and i think you nailed it because you even did it you even shared your your personal situation in the correct order and that is you'll be talking to them and then shift what I identified is anybody that starts casual is starting in a minus one position. When you start professional and then move to casual, I'm talking about the conversation and the introduction in the sales call or the sales interaction. When you start professional and then move casual, you're up to. You start casual and then try to, to squeeze in the professional aspect of whatever reason you were there for to, to return. You're starting from a deficit and then trying to play catch up. So we think that it's all about bond interaction. We bond with them. Let's get some casual conversation going. Man, the most respectful thing you could do to them is be respectful of their time. Come to the most meaningful thing. You meet them in their workplace. And a lot of professionals, it's their profession and what they do. And if that's what you're selling them to help their profession. So if you're bringing new dental tools to a dentist, that's their profession, man. That's their world. So when you show up and you get right into it by showing them these new instrumentation, new actuated device, you're jumping right in. And then if it goes casual, that's fine. And if they say, hey, I got to go, they cut the casual. But if you come in casual and then they start looking at their watch or say, hey, I got to go. Oh, by the way, let me show you this. You're in a deficit and you're probably not catching up. You probably didn't do a good job to lock in your next return visit. So I imagine a lot of people watching this podcast, whether it's like a truck driver or just a regular office worker or somebody in construction wanting to do better in life, like make more money or like own their own business. How can somebody specifically get into something like medical sales where there is, you know, you're not just selling uh, stuff that's just worth a hundred bucks. You're selling tons and tons tons of medical devices that are worth thousands of dollars. I mean, you're making, like you said, 135 to a million in medical sales. So how can any regular person get into that? That's a good question. So to get into medical sales, I've been giving out a lot of advice on this one because obviously over the years, people ask you, how'd you get into it? How'd you get into it? So to get into medical sales, first, any of the trades that you mentioned, they have to feel in the heart that they have a service heart, like a service mindset. Like they really want to help others find the best solution. So solution mindset or service mindset, like, you know, so, so those two trades you mentioned could easily do it. So you don't want to be money motivated. You want to have, okay. Motivated is one thing. Mindset's another. So money motivated. Sure. We can all be money motivated. Absolutely. Right. Okay. And those trades could absolutely be that if you are a tradesman 
and then all of a sudden you get into sales, that's service industry. You are serving people with all your heart and passion. Those trades don't have to do that. Those trades do beautiful jobs with their hands and then they get paid. And sometimes those trades will be confrontational. Take it or leave it. This is my product. This is my trade. Boom. Sales is going to have to be service and solution oriented. So you got to first some self-awareness. You say solution oriented, meaning like you get paid for the problems you solve. Is that what you're Yeah. You, well, or, or reflect back on your past and looking at, have I been solution oriented? Do I help people fix things? There can be a carpenter on a job site that's helping other people. Maybe he's even interacting with the plumber. Like, Hey man, we're about to put a load bearing wall right here. You know, it might be, if he finds himself influencing the plumber to shift something around or move something or the electrician to <laughs> clean up their mess, which is a, which is a uh, construction oh, joke. It's definitely a running joke. Yeah. If you know, you know, <laughs> if you know, you know, um, and they find themselves on a job site, influencing other tradesmen to do things better, ending in a better product altogether. Hey, sales might be for you. But if you find yourself on a job site, pissing others off, sales might not be for you. Right. Okay. So that, that's what I'm talking about. As in, do you have the right traits for it? So now let's jump right into how do you get in, right? Yeah. First, self-awareness. Can you, are you serving others? Are you solution oriented? Are you seeing things? Can you handle the stress? Self-awareness first. If you check those boxes and you can do it. And then if you're motivated, motivation can come from numerous things. What was told a lot years back was go into selling copy machines for Xerox or some of the other copy machines, sell copiers for 12 to 18 months, because that was a tough sale. Prove yourself with the toughest industry sales, and then people will respect that and take it. There's some other trainings for years. Enterprise was looked at as great training because they're, they're very service oriented. They're running around, they're putting on different hats. They're cleaning the car, dropping a car off, picking a car up, taking the car to buy a shop. I mean, the, the enterprise, great management system, but also the one thing that people Enterprise sells the management thing. Me as a um, employer looking to hire somebody, I'm looking at the different hats that they can wear. So it almost sounds like if you want to just get in specifically to medical sales, you first have to go find a job in sales. As in like, yep. you can't expect an outcome for something you never put any time into. Correct. Okay. So as, as the majority of the medical sales industry is going to look for sales so they can see your numbers. So they first want to see that you're hitting quota, above quota, growing this region. See, see your numbers, okay? That's numbers is, is percent to quota, how much growth, how much market penetration you made with whatever product or service that you're servicing or selling. Then next, during the interview process, they want to hear that you can put on different hats and, and deliver and handle different things. Then likable, hire you, do good in the interview process, maybe get a junior associate, sales associate, junior sales rep type job, medical things. I took a little different. I didn't need people for, for sales. I felt I had the sales. I just needed them to be able to have a service mindset, service heart, solution, thought process, show some examples of loyalty, not complaining about their last boss. And I would take that person all day long because I knew I could coach the sales part. So I don't care about number. That was me. But how did you find them? Did you find them internally or are these people just... No, no internal. They're just reaching out, looking for... What's funny is my company was a Fortune 100 company that I worked for. Six, this is a big company. So you're talking 30,000 employees. Six people came from my high school. So with no set previous sales experience or whatever. So did they have a degree or anything? Or? Um, two did not. I was able to get two because we, we showed that they had clinical experience, which then they didn't have to have the degree. But yeah, nowadays it's hard. You have to have a degree. They want numbers. Okay. So for myself, I... One of my, one was a sparring partner and I'll never forget. We were taking a break between rounds and he said, he's graduating. I thought he was getting his bachelor's and he says, no, I'm getting my MBA. And he was a detective in the sheriff's department. I didn't realize he was getting his MBA. I said, oh, what are you gonna do with that? And we had a conversation. I said, dude, you should come with me. He goes, no, I don't want to. Cause he was scared of sales. So I made him ride with me. I made him go into the operating room. I made him meet patients. I made him see me program the patients. He fell in love. He saw the service part and that was in his heart so it's almost like he he didn't even know really what it was but you were like listen i think you'll be good just come look at it test the waters just see if it's something you even might be interested in yeah kind of, i guess kind of like what we're doing right now as in like it, if you're even interested in the book check out this episode before you have to buy it because this is all free yep all oh yeah information yep. giving away a lot that's in the in the book so now he's a three time no four times president's club winner 
What does that mean to be a President's Club winner? Yeah, obviously I know what President's Club is, but uh, go ahead and explain it for Joey and a few words. So any sales force, they'll usually take the top 10%, and depending on the size, maybe it could be 20%. They take the top 20%, and they they call that line. They draw a line in the sand. They say anybody with their percent of growth, percent of revenue, percent of profit, whatever whatever the company decides is their m- metric that they want to measure, they'll draw a line in the sand. Top 10% are our President's Club winners. So if you have a sales force of 100, it's top 10 reps in the whole entire thing. So it's, it's a pretty big deal to be President's Club winner. And then you have the rep of the year, which is the number one out of, out of all of them. I'm assuming the President's Club winner is the guy who's making it good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you're, if you are, uh, yeah, if you're making President's Club winner, you're, uh, you're caught up in your car notes. Actually, you don't have any car notes, but. So I guess I, I want to leave into kind of why why you wrote this book. So if, if you've made all this money. Oh, sorry to cut you off. So, sorry to squeeze this in there. It sounds important. It is, and I'm so sorry. So that was the way that I did it with with um, um, Cole too. Cole was parking golf carts at a golf course. Oh, so this really is just regular guys. Oh, love that job. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, it was so funny. When we would show up, I would catch slack because um, the other guys were hiring these. I don't want to be careful on how I describe them, but they were hiring all these people that looked like cookie cutter pharmaceutical reps or whatever that were polished, had all these degrees. And I was, I had a, I had guys that could take you out in the back, uh, back parking lot and beat you. Burn, burn, uh, burn, yeah. Burn. <laughs> so yeah, three, three cage fighters on the team. So he was parking golf carts. Yeah. But he had a service heart. You know this. He had a service heart, still does to this day. He's now a pastor of a church for years. He's been a pastor of a church and he, he is a good godly man that will like you need something he is there for you one of the other guys that i hired was the x-ray tech in the or he was on a job interview for six months and didn't know it i watched him like a hawk he would open the door for me he was polite he'd help the circulating nurse move the patient he would get the c-arm one step ahead he was running the c-arm for the physician he's like sir is this right he'd line up i was just sitting there watching him so okay i met with my other guys hey so you guys been watching curtis i said um you guys ever catch him like yelling or talking bad about somebody like no okay this dude's for real then so six months this guy had no idea he was in a job interview finally i came to him one day like in my mind i've already like okay you're hired to get the job right so now i come to him actually actually ask him about coming to work with us i put the cart before the horse on this one curse i'd like you to come work with us oh i don't know about that <laughs> for some reason in my mind i thought he was gonna be like oh thank you i hit the lottery no i had to convince him to i had to essentially sell him on taking a job with us and now he's been there 12 years and he is he is amazing i, I, I love that love him he is that, that's something I believe is uh, you never know who's watching, so always do your best. Yeah, he's he's an example of that. So now, when people say, "Hey, what do I do to get into medical sales?" You can go into you can go into sales, okay, and you try to put up with anything that's coming your way. Think growth, growth, growth. Think every time your coaching opportunity is a true coaching opportunity. Know that you are in this sales job to be the best, to become the best you can. Receive the coaching. You know, however, you know, even though you're thinking about leaving industries. Pour yourself in, be present for the moment in this sales role. Show your numbers, be networking as much as you can with with reps. Okay, that's one way to absolutely do it. It's still, it worked 10 years ago, it still works today. Here's another sneaky backdoor entry into medical sales. So right here, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this on the, on the YouTube podcast or whatever. Scrub tech. Get a degree. Okay. Scrub tech. Become a scrub tech. If you are a likable at just anything, yeah, get a degree. It could be business management. It could be biology. Whatever it is, get it. Could it be like an associate's or? Mm-hmm. What actually is a scrub tech? So scrub tech is you have the physician, okay, scrubbed in. You have the circulating nurse who's, it's her it's her room, right? She's she's making sure that the chart's pulled, all the stuff is pulled prior. Anesthesia's in there. It's the right patient. We're cutting on the correct side. She's making sure timeout's done, okay? She's in charge. The other person scrubbed in, who is the assistant to the physician, the surgeon, is the scrub tech. They also have a job of pulling all the supplies first and prepping the room, putting over the blue sterile table, you know, getting all the, the, the equipment up and running. They handle stress. They have to be one step ahead, handing the instrumentation to the physician as the physician is going. They're the ones that are interacting with all implantable medical device reps because the reps are there. They can't touch the sterile table, so they're pointing with their finger about three feet away from the table, 
So you need to put that together with that and oh, see that? No, no, no. That's just a protective sheath. Pull that off. That goes, in, that goes in the trash. Yep. It's okay to throw it away. And they throw it away. They're walking through, putting stuff together, mixing stuff, cement for kyphoplasties and other products. Scrub tech is very important. Good scrub techs make medical device reps so happy. We walk into an OR and, and you know, you get one emotion from the physician, another emotion from what scrub tech you got assigned, got assigned to your case because they can ruin you. They can put things together backwards, screw things up. If you have a degree and you are a likable person, become a scrub tech. You will network with all the reps and somebody's going to steal you from that hospital. Somebody's going to steal you. So how long does it is, and before we get into the next topic, so how long does it take to get your degree, become a scrub tech, and then get into medical sales? I'm thinking in terms of like, I could look at being an anesthesiologist just because I want to make a lot of money mm -hmm. or a doctor. And I know I'm going to be in years of school versus getting an associate's degree becoming a scrub tech. Yeah, scrub tech is one of those faster um, degrees, faster than associates. Degree. So you'd probably do it in a few years. Yep. Oh, no, 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 no. Way less than that. I like that you emphasize yeah. on... It's like an OR. I'm sorry, Jordan, I just cut you off. Yeah. It's like a medical assistant for the OR. So okay. it's like a medical assistant degree. And a medical assistants are another one. Great intro too. If you don't want to be in the OR sales, you want to be in selling to doctor's offices or clinics, become an MA with a degree. So when you meet a smart scrub tech, it's like you know them. You want them in your case. They're like gold. Orthopedic reps would be the first one to steal them. And they become, and then now as a scrub tech, you become a tray runner and you're running trays of screws and, and um, you know, total knees and stuff like that from OR to OR. You're not the sales rep, but you're in. We, we, I was just going to say, I like that you emphasized uh, about being a likable person because I feel like you need that if you're getting into sales. And I mean, I know you personally, if I can pay you a little bit of a compliment, I think that's why you've been so successful is your ability to connect with people and I don't know anybody in your circle that you haven't made better or attempt to make better. You know, it's like uh, you based off of like by who you know, and I don't think there's anybody that wouldn't be like, wouldn't have you in their circle and benefit from it. You know, that's awesome. I'd agree. I mean, you sounded excited just about describing how quickly somebody could jump into becoming a scrub tech to then making a lot of money. Like you genuinely, like I was, I was listening to you like, I'm kind of excited to try this. <laughs> I want to be a scrub tech. How do I? How do I sign up? I made it sound up. I, yeah, I love what I do. So this book is not all about medical sales. Yeah, that's my next question. Like, why did you write the book? Like, for what reason did you create this for the viewers? Like I said earlier, the observations globally was like, it was just a blessing. For, first of all, there's a lot of stuff outside the U.S. It's very eye-opening, political and all that type of stuff. Very eye-opening. So I wrote this book from those observations because now I finally understood why I was successful. I wasn't the guy going around telling you why I'm successful. I actually, when that young rep wanted to know, well, what is it you do? I actually kind of fell back because after I would tell them something, I'd walk away and like knowing, I, I, yeah, I believe that, but is that really why I'm successful? Like, I don't, I didn't know how to answer the question. And you're talking, I was, I was never not in presence club. So I was 10 times presence club, number one revenue guy, seven out of 11 years selling cut my territory six times. No territory in the company I worked with, no territory was ever cut six times. They were cutting me because I was making too much money. And you can say what you want to say, but there's jealousy and middle management. They cut your territory to bring you back down and humble you, get you some humble pie. And then- It's really like a good problem to have. <laughs> yeah, right. I feel like that's all I've ever eaten is humble pie. <laughs> it's like paying taxes, right? Don't complain about paying taxes because that, that one day can go away. No income, no pay taxes. you problem solved. So this book comes from those observations. It clearly came to me observing other great reps, observing mediocre reps that I was able to pour into and work with them to find something that would help them become better and watching them grow up. Like, yep, that was the variable. We just changed a little bit of this and a little bit of that and boom, they took off. Working with the, the underperformers and, and then identifying which ones are probably not gonna make it, which ones, you know, either coaching them up or out, right? Uh, coach, you're coaching them, helping them, pouring into them. We're either going to find you a better job somewhere else or we're going to find you're, you're going to make your way up. So that's why I, I wrote this book. So this book is a sales process. I believe it's one of the, I hate to put outlandish comments. I believe it's the best sales process in sales and not just medical sales, industrial sales. I think this types of conversations will, will help you make an impact on somebody. Yeah, if you're doing real estate, it helps. I can vouch for that. Real estate. So I wrote this book because too many people try to adopt something that's not themselves. This book will help you be authentic. It'll help you find your voice, your purpose, and it helps more of a guardrails to be able to just 
be yourself as you're interacting with others. I don't want you to change. It sounds like this is the this is the answer to that question those people would ask you. Like, how are you so how are you so successful? What did you do? And instead of giving them some like fancy quote of, you know, it took me twenty seven years to become an overnight success. You Wake know? up at four and run two miles. Yeah. It sounds like this is the book is the answer to that question. Like how did you like this is everything that you've accumulated condensed down into a book where you're like, look, now I can actually give it to you. This is the answer that I wanted to give you that I couldn't give you yeah. before. I wish I could go back to those young reps and say, hey, if you're watching, there you go. <laughs> it it kind of goes back to what I said about you earlier. You've made a career of making everybody around you better. And it's like now you wrote a book to make everybody better, you know? I appreciate that. That's a good way to look at it. And um, yeah, I'll, I, I receive that word. Thank you. I appreciate it. When they cut my territory six times, those territory cuts sucked because I lost, I would lose my best associate sales individual because they would get the territory. And I would lose the most loyal customers because management felt that they couldn't screw up the most loyal customer. And they knew that I would go out and hunt and farm new customers. So it sucked. But something that brought brought me happiness is out of the six times my territory is cut, five of those reps that I hired, trained, poured into that went off got territory, five of them made Presence Club. Now, I did want to mention a, lo a little bit more about the book. So obviously the secret sauce was giving them a reason to return, but- And trusting and meaningful reason to return. Trusting and meaningful reason to return. But there was things that you mentioned there on like how to exactly do that. And I think it was, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the awareness quotient, the intelligence quotient, quotient, how are you pronounce that word? And then the emotional one, was that it? I want to punch in your face. I think you should. So I should. Yeah, so yeah. That would be great on camera. I'm trying to go off of memory, but I remember the word quotient and I have it all written down. Yeah. So I go off on a tangent in the book about this one. So. I believe it's it's AQ, IQ, and EQ. And I believe the EQ has been was close. Was poorly, close. poorly, poorly identified. And I'm going to make it my point in life to redefine EQ as execution quotient. Emotional quotient puts too much into it. Because I can sell you something and bring up no emotion. I can interact with you and coach you. And I can fire you. I can hire you. And I can have no emotion involved. Emotional intelligence is what they coin it. First of all, why is it not EI? I don't, I don't understand. Someone's, someone got mixed up there. I'm not sure. So it's emotional, you know, quotient, but they don't call it that. They call it emotional intelligence. They're putting too many things in one bucket because then what about awareness? You know, what about processing and how you execute it? So I will say, I'm, I'm kind of glad I butchered it because it sounds like I fired you up. Yeah, you, yeah, you <laughs> did. And I wouldn't have said it as passionately as I did. So, so I, thank you. Now, now look at you. you and you're like, oh, you turned that way. You turned, you turned the table on me about it. So, Thank you. I, I do remember um, and where I'm kind of getting it from, and you said it's the way to sell people. There's a certain level of emotions that are present in a sale. Yeah, they're not all positive. Some are negative. Yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. kind of what I'm remembering just from what you were saying. Absolutely. So there are some good books out there on selling, and they look for pain points, and they try to find the pain point, identify it, and twist that pain up, just twist that pain up. They're invoking negative emotion. Because they want to create enough pain to where you see the only way out, the only solution being the solution that they have. And they're going to walk you that direction. They work in certain situations. I believe that works great for consultants. Do you have any examples of that? Or? Yeah. So in this area, this didn't flood here, did it? I'm not sure. Okay. But in this area, and I know the neighborhood right over there flooded for in, Katrina. Wherever you're watching, he's, he's referring to Louisiana. Yep. So mold, construction, bring it back up. So let's say you're interviewing some general managers or consultants and you interview a couple. You're bringing them in. You're inviting them in. They can sit down at the table with you and they can drill you on questions. Well, what timeline are you looking to do? Well, how much money do you have to spend? Well, what are you, look, you, know, what are you looking to accomplish? How much damage was done? What did you try before? But they could just hit you with all stuff. Then they can sit there and listen for some pain points. And you're like, man, the last house I redid or the last, um, last time I did a remodeling of my home. It took not long and they went past the deadline. Okay. I'm hearing pain points. She doesn't want, he has a time constraint. He doesn't want to go over budget and, and, and over schedule. So now that I identify those pain points, I could just keep poking at you, poke at you. Well, look, man, you choose me to go with you. I'm going to make sure that we're on target, you know, cause, cause where'd your family live while you guys were 
remodeling your last house? You know, was that hard with the kids? You couldn't bathe you know, your small children. And I could really imagine that was frustrating. You and your wife were, you working from home too. And you guys were all trying to work together with the small kids. You sound invested in me. Yeah. How, how, how tough was that? Right. So now you're, you're sharing with me and I'm, what I'm doing is I'm just twisting that dagger or I found a wound on you and I'm just, you know, moving my finger around inside your open wound or putting salt on it. I'm just building up. And now I was boring it out. Yeah, I was boring it out. Now I'm going to do a blunt dissection for the medical sales guys. Um, so now I'm going to bring you to the point where I'll tell you what, you're not going to pay me until it's done. So I'm in, I'm motivated to make it on deadline. And I'll tell you what, for every, for every month I'm over, you can reduce me by 5%. Now you're like, oh my gosh, this guy's going to come in on target. He's not, I, he's talking about bringing the price down, not up, you know? So now you're going to go talk about it. I hit on all the emotions and I showed you the pathways me. That is a lot of question-based selling. Okay. Good stuff. Works in this, in this, in this scenario where you invited me in. Now flip the script. You're thinking you're going to repair the house yourself. I come knocking on the door. You open the door up. Hey man, this is a cold cell. Yep. So we're going, we were basically like a warm cell and now it's a cold cell. Correct? Absolutely. Okay. That's what I do. That's, yes, you do. Cold cells. It's not fun, but so. You gotta be used to, sorry, you gotta be so, used to rejection. Yeah. Yeah. This book, this book will work both for warm but I believe it's the only book that will work for a long sales cycle, starting with a cold sale. So now I knock on the door. Now it's cold call, right? Now I'm, do you think I'd get away with asking any of those questions after you open the door and like, who, who are you? Hey man, I'm a general contractor. I'm doing a house next door and the house over there. I know it's your flooded too. Dude, I, you know, I do this, this, and this, but what if I don't tell you what I do? What if I start asking those same type of probing questions like, Hey, you know, when are you looking to have your house finished? What's your budget? Let's let's go with that question right there. I just knocked on your door. You opened up. Hey, you're a stranger. And I just asked your budget. I, I mean, I wouldn't tell you what it is. Well, I'd be like, who who are you? How do I know you're actually a representative of a company? I don't... Who are you? <laughs> I don't know what else to ask. So negative emotion coming up, but not not towards your pain, towards me, right? Like, how who are you? Yeah. How dare you? Yeah, who's this guy? Get off, yeah. get off my lawn. So... There you go, right there. There are books out there that their processes don't work when you're not invited in. And this process does. This process, you can come in, you bring value from your first interaction, and you earn the right to start adding questions. And then back to your main point you were asking about negative emotion, positive emotion. Emotions help speed up when you're trying to influence a change in behavior, right? So the, the, the more the emotion, the faster the catalyst is to get a change in behavior, right? And that can either be positive or negative. If you come in all negative, nobody's going to want to be around you after the third or fourth visit because right. you're just, you know, the, the, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And, you know, you can come in positive and positive is great, but sometimes people don't pull a trigger. So I believe a good 80-20 rule, 80-20 works in so many aspects of life, but come in 80% positive, 20% negative. And what some people believe is, oh, I sell with logic. Mm, good luck. Because there's a lot of logical stuff around here that people don't do. Exercise. Logically, we should all be exercising. Logically, we should all be eating healthy. But you're not going to change your behavior on your eating habits unless you have a very strong positive emotion injected into you, right? It sounds like it's a mix of uh, emotion and logic. Like you have to have a, a beautiful blend of both because it's like the guy going into any kind of sale or just in business with a ton of emotion, but he has no plan to back it up. He's like a bottle rocket. He shoots off and he, he's, he's selling people on motion and he's excited. And then eventually he's, you know, he's, he just yep. dies out. No, it's really good. Like the logical person who's like, here's my plan. Step one to step 10. And this is how it's going to work. But there's no like, there's no fire. There's no energy to it. He's not selling anybody. Yep. That's, that's absolutely right. So you got three, three buckets, essentially. Some people will make a purchase off of logic and logic only, right? Your car is, the lease on your car is up. It's now time to go get a new one. I look at what's out there, best gas mileage, lowest lease price. I'm going to go lease this, this type of car now. Logically it's done. Boom. Cause there are people out there that don't care about what kind of car they drive. So logic can, can make decision. Positive emotion, absolutely drive it in the negative emotion. And you need a nice, healthy blend of all of them to move, to move the needle, to, to get people to change behavior. And believe it or not, depending on your personality type as the consumer, so we're looking at the personality type of the prospect that we're selling to. If you can quickly identify the personality type, then you can lean a little bit more heavy in one of in one of those types of buckets. 
using the, the resources in one of those buckets more than the other one. And what you're doing is you're not manipulating them. You're helping them receive the message because different personality types receive differently. And that's a big one that people kind of get with. I do not believe that sales is manipulation. I believe, I believe the word, you know, it's sad that, that when people say selling, 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 or you're selling me has a bad notation to it. I believe any time that you influence somebody to do something that is absolutely not better for them, the word for that is manipulation. And any time you help educate or influence someone to do a change in behavior that is better for them, that is sales. And you are a salesperson and you sold them. And it should be a good description. It should be a good, like, you know, there should be a... a That's a really good way to explain that because I always... I always struggled with the word manipulation because it's it sounds like a dirty word. You could yep. say intelligence earlier, so that <laughs> that's not true. Well, it the word manipulation it sounds like a dirty word, but it could be used for good. So, like if my son does not want to eat real food and all he wants to eat is junk food, and I can manipulate him to eat healthy food, and that's a good thing. But I, I like that the difference. If you're doing something good, it's almost that's sales. That's not manipulation. I like that. Yeah. I like to match people's energy. Like if I have a client and he hates something that day, I hate that twice as much that day. If he likes it, that's the best thing I've ever heard. You know, you just got to uh, match their energy. I can confirm Jordan does it quite a lot. Mm -hmm. He does it with me all the time. I'll back you up. If you're mad about something, God, it's the worst thing I've ever heard. Yeah, I what? hate that. Man, that sucks. That's terrible. Jordan, do you even know what that is? No, but that's awful. Yeah, I'm on your side. <laughs> oh, that is so funny, Jordan. There's, there's times when you brought me... I'm reflecting back on times you've actually done that with me where you brought me something and then I'll say something like that. And then you're like, yeah, me too. That was stupid. It's called loyalty. <laughs> Jordan's a natural salesman. Yeah. So there's a, there's a term in the book and I, I feel like I coined it, but it's hard to coin anything because I feel that any, everybody, everything has been said, everything has done. There's a lot of, you know, people that were, were standing on the shoulders of a lot of bright people in the past that have, so, so have, saying that, I feel like I did coin this term of disassociation. And that is where I'm coming up. And I don't know how you feel about electric cars. So I say, I just read this article and it was interesting, but these electric cars are, they're saying that the, the motors and the maintenance are going into the 200,000, that reliability is going to be, it's a, the cost savings will really kick in on year seven to 10. Don't know much about it, but I'm kind of going to keep my open for another article. Boom. I stop. Now it's my turn to see how you feel about it or whatever. I didn't associate myself to it. I'm disassociated from it. I mentioned the article. I mentioned it's interesting, but if you go negative on it, I don't have to like jump in on the bandwagon with you. I can say, huh, I'm going to keep my eyes open. I'm going to keep that in the back of my head when I read the next article. And I might think from that thought process on that too. You might be opening my eyes on that. You are actually keeping your mind open, but you're, you're, you're cautiously dipping your toe in the water because if they are passionate against electric cars because of what are we going to do with the batteries when they go dead? It's, it's, there's the mining of the minerals is, is hurting people. And dude, there's two sides to every store on electric cars and gas cars. But if you get somebody passionate, then you might ruin it. So you're disassociating yourself as you're presenting. It. And now I know how they feel about that. So we were, um, we were talking before and there's a, there's a great story. Uh, I want to get Travis to tell for you guys, for what you're saying right now, it reminds me of a story specifically in the book where Travis was trying to sell an elderly couple where he was doing, um, what was it again? I was a stockbroker for Edward Jones. And he was teaching, he was teaching the wife just stuff about stocks. And the older guy was just constantly, you know, he, I don't want none of that. You know, you can teach my wife, but get out of here. I don't want none of this. Tell the whole story. Let him tell. Well, I want him to tell. I want him to tell his next story. Uh, just because I don't want to get too deep into this, and I, but I want the viewers to know that it's in the book because it's it's fantastic. It covers a lot of the stuff he does. Heard. But this guy just get out of here. I don't want none of your sales. Get out of here. Is that how he sounded? <laughs> it's closed. <laughs> it's closed. And he just kept coming back every single time, and he would give him little bits of information, like, "Hey, did you check out this stock?" And just leave it at that. You know, I don't want to sell you, but and then he would go on and do his lesson with the wife. And just over time, you know, this guy kind of gave that little, get a little side eye and eventually, okay, all right. I checked it out. It was kind of promising. I'm like, you know, and then over time he built a relationship and, uh, it was just, it was very successful. Um, and the book, I mean, 
it covers a story even better than that. Obviously, you don't you don't get the voice when you read the book. Maybe I could be in the, in the audio. Who knows? He might do it in the audio. His voice wasn't that bad. He, he he could change it up. That guy was world traveled. He was very sharp. He he would trade, and he would let me know that he was smarter than me. And I, heck, he he might have been a better trader than me. It was a really it was awesome. And I would I asked him what what are you trading? He would tell me. So I'd go and I'd research it and I'd pull out what I think and then I would just hey I, I I looked into it here and I'd hand it to him. I'd turn around. Didn't try to like tell him I know everything and I'm really you know boo boo and try to go punch for punch on it. I wasn't gonna, I knew I couldn't match him. So I'd drop it off and then he would read over it. And when I'd go to leave on the way out the door, he'd go, ah, this one's overvaluated, blah, 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 the earnings per share. And he would say something. I was like, okay, okay, no taken. And then he'd go look into the EPS on that one. But he gave me something back and I'd come back again. I was honing it in. I was getting closer. It's like throwing darts. Let's say you haven't played darts in, in two months or two years. That very first dart that you throw you're going to make adjustments off of that first start. You go to the driving range. You haven't hit golf balls in, in a year. Your very t first time you hit the ball, you make adjustments from that. You either move your foot a little bit or move your hands. You make small adjustments. So that's what I was doing with him. I was getting closer and closer to the bullseye and I finally hit the bullseye on him. Yeah, and guys, it's it's a fantastic story. I just, it stuck out to me because a lot of what he does is in that story. Um, but the story that I want you to tell just kind of as we're getting, starting to close getting close to ending the podcast was how you got started your resume in the trash can uh just because well, it's a it's a it's such a fantastic story before we get to kind of where he is now where you guys can go to buy the book which also it's in the link down below wherever you're watching this go buy the book it's awesome but i i wanted i really wanted you to tell this story okay so cold calling is how i did it with 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 the resume and the headhunter that you're discussing. So I'm going to back it up one more step just to let the audience know. Yeah, we were we were talking before this, and, like, he's got to tell this story. So Edward Jones, when I was a stockbroker for Edward Jones, I was a stockbroker for them for three years. Good company, good training. You pass the Series 7, 63 license, so you, can, you're, you are a licensed stockbroker, sell annuity, sell life insurance. They are conservative. They teach you to care for the customer, everything. Okay. Back in the day, 20 years ago, you had to knock on doors to get business. I knocked on over 3000 doors. Okay. In a suit, my wife would drop me off in front of a neighborhood and she'd come back four hours later and pick me up. She felt so bad for me. That couple that you talked about, I knocked on their door and then through time was invited into their family and that husband did not and he did not want me in there. It's a special person that can make it through door-to-door -door sales. Oh, that yeah, that's what I'm saying. I was like, it, the stories all tie together, but this one is it's awesome. So I'm a, I'm a mortgage origination, mortgage originator. I want to get into medical sales. Don't know much about device sales. I'm thinking pharmaceutical because I don't know any better. And that was hot back then. So I my resume, I fax it in. So I faxed it to Don Scheel. And I called Don Scheel the next day. I said, Don, this is Travis McCoy. I called yesterday, got your fax machine, I sent your resume. He goes, I, I don't have your resume. And I said, this is you trying to get a job? Yes. So I am doing mortgage origination. I've been doing some financial selling. Now I'm doing, I'm a mortgage originator. And I just want to get out of that industry and I want to go into medical sales. Right. Okay. So this is it. So I find a headhunter. This was the guy. This was the guy. How did you, so first, how did you find him to be able to send him this? The yellow pages. This is a book. That probably, if you picked it up, is the biggest book you'd ever hold in your hands. In the Yelp pages, there was his name, and I heard it from somebody else, so I knew he was the man. He was the head hunter. He was 72 at the time. He was like the godfather in the area of head hunting for only medical sales, pharmaceutical. All jobs in this region went through Don Shield. So I call him up, get his fax number, fax to him, call him the next day, follow up. He says, I don't have your resume. I said, I, I faxed it yesterday. He goes, oh, wait, hold on. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I got it. He, I threw it away. I'm thinking, what did he just say? And then I hear him uncrumbling it. And I can only envision in my head, he's on the side of his table, taking a balled up piece of paper and undo it, because I can hear the noise on the phone. He looks at it and he goes, yeah, yeah, that's the worst resume I've ever seen. I said, hey, I would love to come meet you. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I said, 
please, tomorrow, I can come tomorrow at nine o'clock. I just threw it out there. You know, it's cold calls. You just throw out a time. He goes, all right, that's fine. Don't dress up because I'm not. <laughs> I dress up anyways. But sure enough, I show up and he was not dressed up. This dude was wearing a light white, kind of like a half white, half gray tennis suit. Zipped down a little bit with his undershirt, matching sweatsuit pants with a gold chain. Big old thick glasses. I mean, he looked like the Godfather. Right? So I look at him, I'm standing in the doorway like, Don, trust McCoy. And I'll never forget, he took his glasses, he brought them down about a quarter inch, and he goes, you're a lot better looking than your resume. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. I'll take any compliment right now because right now I was so scared. Like Worst resume you ever saw. So I sat down with him and he just rips it apart, rips me apart. We get into it. I'm just taking it all in. No defensiveness. Keyword, no defensiveness. I was so hungry. I would have done anything. I would If he had said, go out there and wash my car, I would have got out there and washed his car right then and there. There was no way I would have had any anger towards him, no matter what he would have said about me. I, there was no ego walking in. I knew what I wanted. And I sat there and he tore that resume apart. He told me to redo it. I mean, and sometimes he kind of drilled a little too deep in certain situations. Like, okay, okay, I, I get it. <laughs> Next, he says, you're going up for this first job. And, you know, I had reasons to return. So I kept coming back to him with corrections. We kept the communication going. He set me up to interview for one job. He coached me, coached me, coached me. And then I'll never forget. He said, but I don't want you to get it. Totally confused. I said, but what do you mean? Because it's, ph it's pharmaceutical. Yeah, I, I don't want you in pharmaceutical. I was like, well, wh why not? He said, Don, they said you're going to get a, I get a new Intrepid. This is 1999. This is going to be a fine ride. Um, so I said, Don, Intrepid. And he goes, no, nah, no. Nah. I said, well, what? You want me to ruin it? No, 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 no. Just just don't get the job. It's like, I don't understand. I interviewed. I came up number two. A cheerleader from LSU, she got it. He goes, good, 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 good. Okay, now this next job, I want you to get it. It's like, well, it's not, not I kind of remind him. Don, it's like, a, not like I'm in charge here. <laughs> and he coached me through that one. I got that job. I was selling capital equipment. I was selling vital sign monitoring to hospitals, central stations, telepacks, uh, nurses station telemetry, all the computer stuff throughout, throughout hospital. It sounds like the, the karate kid where he's saying, wax on, wax off, and he does it for like a year. He's like, what am I doing this? This makes no sense. Yeah, yeah, he was Don Shield, man. He was, dude, Don, so Don was a big part of my life, and, and then I started to bring, my, man, my loyalty. I think I could have survived the mafia because my loyalty was to Don, so I would bring anybody that wanted a job would go through Don, Don, Don. I'll never forget the day that we paid Don's house off, man. He called and thanked me for one more referral and said, that one paid my house off. And he was a great guy. So I left medical device, uh, selling capital equipment hospitals. I left because the territory was big. I felt like a used car salesman. Not that there's anything wrong with used cars because I did it. But it was an industry I no longer wanted to be in because you, you work to build up a relationship, you sell, and you never see them again. And I didn't know how to truly work referrals. And I could have made it better, but I didn't. I left there to become a stockbroker and chase a dream of being a stockbroker. I become a stockbroker. Don told me not to do it. I said, Don, it's a dream of mine. I want to do it. Past Series 7, I go out there and knock on 3,000 doors. I make, meet some great people and I'm changing what I feel like changing the retirements, but something was missing. Something was just missing. I finally open up an Ever Jones office and now I'm caged inside an office. And it, and it like, I felt handcuffed. I wanted to get back out. But now that I work so hard to open an office, you don't leave there. Your clients come to you. And it's not what I wanted. So I'm starting to have a little resentment for being in it and I'll never forget. My oldest son is now, he is a few months old. He's sitting to the left of my wife. My wife's doing the bills and she holds up a check and she says, this one's not going to clear. I felt so small as a man. Our vocation is our life. The money we bring in. Everything we do, I've made great money selling the capital equipment, but starting off at Ever Jones, you're not paid a lot. So we ran through the savings all the way down. I called Don, said, Don, I want back in. He told me, I told you you shouldn't have got out. I said, no, I want back in. He goes, I told you you should. I said, yes, sir. I need back in. 
back into medical sales. Don says, you just missed an opportunity of a lifetime. There's a company that just, they just invented a new product. They're, they're, they're about to get FDA approval. It's coming to the market. It's an amazing company. I said, perfect. He goes, no, you didn't hear me. You missed it. I said, awesome. You know, the manager, boy, you're not listening to me. I said, oh, so the manager has no loyalty to you? Because I knew he's the godfather and his name's Don. And he says, you're not listening. He goes, he just hired. He goes, he actually hired a guy you sent me, Chuck. And I was like, but Chuck's in, you know, Chuck's on the west co- west side. I said, well, what about he? No. I said, Don, did did you place the manager? Because the, there's always a hiring manager that he has a relationship with. Did you play? Yeah, I placed him at U.S. Surgical 15 years ago. I said, he doesn't owe you? Well, you did that. You're not listening. It's closed. I said, oh, he don't have loyalty to you. Now I was going all negative guys. So this is not my book. This is, this is, this is me doing that 20% all negative. All psychology. And he says, boy, I'll get you an interview and you ain't getting the job because there is no job. I said, thank you, Don. I love you, man. Thank you. And uh, he goes, I don't know why you're thanking me. So he got me that interview and I had nothing to lose. I sat in front of that manager and I put it all out there. I brought it all. I don't recommend interviewing like the way I did, but I was just truthful and desperate. And in this situation, desperate doesn't always work. They got to see the skill set and know that you have the tools to do it. And then desperate and the right tools in the combination make for a powerful combination, but desperate by itself is not going to do it. And he hired me and I started off. When we got FDA approval, we had 50 reps and I had the smallest territory in the country. And that first year of full selling, I finished number two in the whole country. And I never forget sitting in the audience when they were doing the awards and seeing the number one guy on stage and saying, I am going to beat him. The next year I did. And the year after that, and then I, I ran him off into management. When you beat somebody bad enough, they go into management. So I beat him. I beat him right into management. So yeah, Don Shield, man, I owe everything. I owe everything to 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 Don. And um, yeah, that's it's just such a fantastic story. Like just the the vivid imagery in my head of Don and the crinkled resume, and you, you know, being at your last check, like your your wits end, and just I, I need to make this work. It's it's like the true underdog story, and it really just ties in everything we've been talking about. It ties in the book. It ties in how you got started. It ties in how people can get started in medical sales, how they can become successful and actually make money. Like why people should read this book. Like you've been, you knocked on over 3,000 doors, right? Like that's some people's biggest nightmare. They could never. There's just so much perseverance. That's with Ever Jones. When you're talking about selling security systems, because I knocked on a bunch of doors there. But that's the point of it. You know, we asked the question, how do you get into medical sales? How could you make money in doing this? How do you get into sales? The book, how do you sell anything? And like he said, first, know that you're going to be in the service industry. Second, you kind of have to work for it. Anything that's worth anything takes work. Pursuit is the evidence of desire. So, I mean, if you want to go for it, just keep after it. Well said. Uh, what What was the guy's name that you ran off into management? Do you remember? Ryan. Suck it, Ryan. <laughs> Ryan was bigger, taller, stronger, better looking. He was Yeah. You know, he was a wide receiver hey. for Burgum Young University. Was. Was. And I tell you what, <laughs> Ryan, look where Travis is at now. <laughs> he, probably, he probably is. He, 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 was, might, he might be. He was he was successful. He moved on up. He was a VP of two companies, so he yeah. he, he did move on up. But Got him. Travis breaks people down and builds them back up. But yeah, we were good. We were talking about it's good. We were talking about this story uh, before this. I was like, dude, you you got it. You got to tell the story. Um, and it, like I said, it just ties everything in. So to get to kind of towards the end of the podcast, I guess, where are you at now? Um, where can people go to buy the book other than the link below? Because, guys, it does help us out. And, you know, anytime you buy the book, it sends us a little bit of money and we're able to just up our game and do better for you guys. Because at the end of the day, it's about. Y'all, you're the people who watch and subscribe and we're able to get guests and do this stuff for you. So I guess where can people go to find out more about what you're doing or So the book is on Amazon and myself I'm I'm I've moved into consulting. So I'm I'm consulting pre FDA medical companies that are getting FDA, helping them understand what 
where the revenue is going to come from, exploring that with them, how their sales force will come into place, trying to find the value propositions for them as they're applying for billing and coding. So I'm getting involved with some startups very early. Then there's some other mid- mid-sized companies that have been around, great product, great people. And we're just trying to get them over that hump and explode. So I'm doing some consulting um, and staying in the, in the medical field. I'm looking to get back into my other roots of outside of medical. So I'm working with a couple of companies outside of medical. I'm looking to get into keynote speaking. So I've done, uh, I've already done a few keynotes, keynote talks, uh, working on another book too, on awareness. So I touch on in here with the awareness quotient, I touch on how important it is. And when I use the word quotient, there's a reason behind it. So when I say execution quotient, awareness quotient, there are numbers behind that for that quantifying number, the reason for quotient. That's why I had that sour taste in my mouth for emotional intelligence where there is no quotient. If someone walks up to you and says, hey, I want you to be more emotionally intelligent, what, what does that mean? Basically what they're saying is be nicer. That's, that's basically what they're saying. There's no, there's no to do. There's no, there's no formula for it. And here I give you a formula for awareness. I give you a formula for execution. I give you a formula. Should we even touch on the now goals? Coined a term now goals, needs over wants. When I'm going into that account, what do I need to get done versus what I want to get done? The One of the biggest flaws that sales individuals have when they're going into a sales call is in their brain, they're actually believing and hoping, and it could be subconscious or conscious, believing they're going to get the sale right here. And it could even be a somewhat of a short sale cycle product, and they still believe they're going to get it right there, but it's not. And if you ask them afterwards, like, hey, how many sales have you walked right up and got immediately? Not that many. It's usually four, you know, five, six visits. And if it's a long sales cycle, 20. Okay. So why did you go into this first one thinking you're going to get it? You didn't strategize appropriately. You need to go in with now goals, needs over wants. Check off the box. What is the most important thing you need? And if you don't accomplish that, you're not moving on to try to even think you're closing the sale because you're not. So the whole always be closing, that's fun to say and it's good, but it's it's not true. Well, I guess uh, with that being said, man, it was honestly, it was a blast to have you on the podcast. Um, just from all the stories, the book, uh, it, it's all fantastic. Um, and guys, if you want to get the book, obviously please click the link down below, yeah. uh, or you could find it on Amazon. Um, but it really does help us out because we do get a little bit of a kickback from the purchase of the book and it, it helps us grow. I love that part uh, too. Cause I'm not, I'm not looking to make a ton of money off the book. I'm looking to reinvest just to get the word out there. Cause ultimately I'm looking to do some consulting and coaching and, and keynote keynote talks where I can help help more it is nice to see you doing some cool stuff like uh editing editing and links like to uh, you know to a book instead of just normally editing just an idiot bar over my head for once so that's pretty cool to see you do stuff like that it's there now <laughs> yeah hey Jordan's quoted in there too yeah guys so a so man of many talents yes you are I just didn't put your name but I'm sure we've given you like you said before the secret sauce if you if, you have a reason to return as in if you have a reason because you've watched up to this point or listened either get the book or you know what maybe just do some more research figure out if you actually want to get the book look up the reviews because i did i'm not even going to tell you what they are i thought about bringing it up on here but i'm not just go look up the book click the link go look up the book but either way Thank you guys for watching. Thanks for listening. Travis, like I said, it was great. And make sure you subscribe because you can get more fantastic content like this and we can just keep pumping out greatness. So thank you for watching and we hope to see you next time. I will finish with this. Oh, okay. I will finish with this. There are two types of people in the world, awesome people and lame people. Awesome people buy the book. Lame people don't. Which one are you? I'd call that sales, not manipulation. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks, Travis. Thanks, y'all.